So during this talk, I'll just give you a brief overview about who we are what, as a team, um, what we aim to do in terms of research activities. I'll introduce the team um, and I'll talk about what our, our key achievements are to date. And I'll also introduce the projects we're currently involved in and then um, um, Rachel, Karina and, and Richard will um, discuss their projects in more detail. So who are we? Um, DHSV established a Centre for Oral Health Research in February last year. And the centre is involved in um, applied research. And there's two research teams that sit under this Centre for Oral Health Research. And they are the Oral Health Practice Research Unit, or as we abbreviate it to OHPRACRU. And I'll be talking about us today. And also there's the Population Oral Health Research Unit, or AFIRST, who you heard speak to you earlier this morning. So as a research unit, what do we aim to do and achieve? Um, our goal is to promote excellence in oral health practice through collaborative evidence-based research. And so I think it's very relevant to um, the clinicians in the room. Um, because we are interested in improving oral health practice. We also are very, um, very focused on doing collaborative research as well with key stakeholders. And we're also very much focused on having an evidence base behind the research that we do. And our vision is to achieve positive patient-centred outcomes for Victorians that access public sector dental care. So whilst we're doing all this research, um, we are very focused on the patient um, and the patient's outcomes. Um, the unit has six main objectives that we aim to achieve. The first one is that we aim to establish an evidence base for best clinical practice. And we do a lot of this by doing systematic reviews, um, looking at what the evidence is in the literature, and through this, we also identify any gaps that we feel that need to be investigated. The second objective is that whilst we're very focused on looking at clinical um, effectiveness of any oral health practice interventions that we look at, that it's also very important that we assess the cost effectiveness of any such intervention. And the sort of interventions that we focus on are things like reorientation of services and also the implementation of new clinical procedures, so new techniques that can benefit the community. Um, and Rachel will talk about um, the hall technique and Karina will talk about um, the minimal intervention dentistry work that she's doing. Um, and we're also looking at innovative models of care. So how can we do things better, more effectively? How can we utilise the workforce to the best advantage? And that follows on to where we develop and evaluate innovative workforce models. And um, probably some of you would be aware of um, the work that Hanny has led on extension of scope of practice for dental therapists in Victoria to now treat um, adults over 26 years of age. We also investigate and evaluate workforce capacity building educational programs. And so a couple of these are we've looked at upskilling um, dental clinicians and dental assistants in working with preschool children and also with working with um, children and adolescents with special needs. And we've actually been able to evaluate these and write them up for publication. Um, it's a big focus of our work is not only to do the research and to find out what the outcomes are, but to actually translate the research into practice. So we do work with government and regulatory boards and um, all important stakeholders to ensure that the work that we actually do is translated into practice. And the last one is that we develop, implement and evaluate clinical audits and Richard will talk um, to his project about that aspect. Um, so there are a number of dental research units um, around the country and we worked as a team to work out how we are different to other teams. And we feel that we're unique because our research activities are focused on influencing public policy and clinical practice by leading evidence-based oral health clinical research. So we're very much focused on um, clinical practice and we're also involved in translating that 
um, that research into practice. So this is um, an image of um, some of the members of, of our team. There's a few of us missing. Um, but we've got a really diverse skill mix. We've got people that have got expertise in research coordination. We've got some, um, some of our team have got clinical skills, not only in dentistry, but in other health professions. We've got epidemiology and statistical expertise. Um, a number of us are involved in education and teaching. Um, some of us bring um, an, a, um, a good knowledge of the public dental health sector. We've got a systematic review fellow on the team. We've got a health economist who looks after um, the assessing cost effectiveness aspects. We've also got data management expertise, information technology and administrative support. So we feel that we're a very well-rounded team that um, has a lot of expertise to offer. Um, in the 15 months or so that we've been together, um, our key achievements are that we've been able to establish partnerships um, both nationally and internationally, um, particularly in the United Kingdom and New Zealand for our international colleagues. Um, we've established an advisory group for the Oral Health Practice Research Unit to make sure that we are relevant to the public dental sector um, and the advisory group have met three times. We've had some success in getting some um, grants and one of these is the DHSV Research and Innovation Grant and the other one is through a philanthropic organisation, um, the William Buckland Foundation. Um, we've got four main projects underway at the moment. Um, we've got the assessed cost effectiveness of minimal intervention dentistry, the whole technique, the adherence to clinical guidelines pilot study, and we've also got systematic um, literature reviews being undertaken. And we've been lucky that we've been able to publish a number of papers on our work so far. Um, and the last thing that I'll touch on is I'll just show you a few screenshots of our new website because it's only got online on Thursday. Um, so if any of this interests you after um, our presentations, all our contact details are on there um, and you can uh, make contact with us. So we've got um, the first web page there is for the Centre of Oral Health Research and the second one which I'll just show you a few pages of is for the Oral Health Practice Research Unit. So um, this one is just the overarching centre for oral health research. It has our research and innovation strategy um, and also our research governance framework. Uh, this one um, is reminiscent of a few slides ago and it's um, of our team. It talks about what our mission and vision is and, um, and what our exper expertise and our focus is. Um, on the team page, if you're interested in contacting any of us, all our details are on there. Um, and also our um, particular research interests. Um, also, if you want to read about any of the work that we've done, we've got our publications now online on that page, so you can go in and, and access any of the, the research that you're interested in. Um, and also, um, we've got a, a page for each project that we do. So um, this one is the, the Minimal Intervention Dentistry Project. Um, but any of these pages will give you information about um, the work that we do. So I'd like to thank you for your time and um, I'll let my um, other team members speak on their particular projects. So the whole technique is a uh, very simple method of uh, managing caries in primary molars. Uh, it's also useful for managing hyperplastic primary molars. Um, Um, and the beauty of it is that there's absolutely no need for caries removal, there's no need to use anaesthetic. So there's no need to pick up a drill and no need to use a needle. Um, so it simply involves very good diagnosis. You need to have radiograph of the tooth and um, you use, um, you find the right size to, of the stainless steel crown to fit the tooth, you use GIC and you, and you get the child to assist you in, um, in placing the crown and, and um, putting pressure on it themselves. So it does involve careful case selection though um, and a high level of clinical judgment. It's a um, technique that was discovered basically by accident in around 1998 in Scotland. 
um, where an audit found that one dentist was doing an extraordinary number of these of stainless steel crowns, um, and it wasn't known why. Um, so it, it was then discovered that they were being put on to uh, Frank Carey's, um, and then a pilot study was done to check, to check the technique out, and it was found to be acceptable to clinicians and their patients, and a further clinical trial was done um, by colleagues uh, Innocent Evans in Scotland, and compared with uh, traditional restorative techniques um, placed by dentists. So overall, the whole technique was found to be, A, acceptable by children, parents and their dentists, but it was also found to be a far more effective technique than conventional restorations. Indeed, at four years, 92% of the whole technique uh, teeth were found to be successful compared to 52% of teeth with uh, conventional restorations. Um, so the whole technique has the potential to improve compliance in young children. So as well as a caries management technique, it is, it is an, a behavioural management technique and it can uh, reduce anxiety associated with dental treatment. So no drill, no, um, no needle. Uh, you can imagine that children are far more accepting of this technique. What we also think it has the potential to do is to increase the use of stainless steel crowns by clinicians. And we know uh, through DHSB data that uh, clinicians across Victoria are not liking using stainless steel crowns. Out of um, all the multi-surface restorations that are placed in, in, in children in, in, um, in Victoria, uh, about 3 to 4% <coughs> of these restorations are stainless steel crowns. So we know that the numbers aren't, aren't high at all. And, um, that, and the thing is that we know that stainless steel crowns are the best, the most enduring uh, restoration for carious primary molars. So um, we're very keen to see that, we can see that the um, use of this can be increased if the, the, the use of whole technique. Um, some of the um, population health outcomes that we uh, anticipate that the whole technique has the potential to um, effect are uh, that avoiding the negative child health impacts and the cost of repeat treatment uh, associated with uh, multi-surface restorations. Um, and if you look at that failure rate, uh, the, the lower success rate of the conventional restorations, you can understand how that might be a potential um, advantage. Um, we also um, uh, uh, see that there's a potential to reduce the number of tooth extractions and extensive treatment. But also uh, in conjunction with prevent a preventive program to reduce hospital admissions for dental treatment under gen general anaesthesia. And we know that, um, that uh, d dental treatment is the third most common cause of um, admission to hospital for zero to 14 year olds. <coughs> and that at a cost of two and a half thousand per admission, um, that could be uh, quite a cost that we can, we can affect. So um, here our unit at, at um, DHSB we're conducting the first Australian research into the hall technique um, with preschool children. Um, and we have just uh, completed our first phase, phase one, a pilot phase, where we've looked at um, the success, uh, and we will still be looking at the success of the technique over the next three years in um, preschool children. And also we're looking at the acceptability of the technique amongst the uh, oral health practitioners that place them and the preschool children and their primary carers. Um, amongst the methods, I'll flip through this, but um, we are looking at three to five years old and one or two uh, primary molars with caries in the outer half of dentine with no palpable symptoms or pathology. Um, we have worked initially with uh, one a community agency and then another came on board for this pilot project, North Richmond and Plenty Valley. And um, we inducted all dental staff into the study who, who assisted with screening, um, but we trained only four dentists in the whole technique. And we used the IC-DAS to identify, IC-DAS 2 to identify um, suitable children. Just uh, quickly an example of uh, one of our patients uh, in the, in the um, study. And you can see there's caries um, on all these primary molars here. But for instance, this was a perfect one for us to put a whole technique on, a whole technique crown. Importantly, a band of dentine between the caries lesion and the pulp. And that's very important. In, in our pilot study, we've been very conservative with the, um, with this, with the amount of the extent of caries. 
in our next phase of the study will probably be a little less conservative. But importantly too, no um, interradicular um, pathology. Um, so with our recruitment in the pilot phase, we screened around 160 children. We placed eventually 22 crowns on 14 children. We had a, a, um, a two-stage screening and recruitment um, phase. Early results from our pilot study are, um, for instance, an average time for the whole technique is five and a half minutes, and that's just from that small number of children. Um, but that to bear in mind that that includes actually testing the size of the, of the crown as well. Um, so we think that's pretty good. Um, the, uh, the bite of the child can be opened um, initially by 1.5 to 2 millimetres, but has generally uh, reduced back to normal within 30 days, back to baseline. Clinicians reported positive behaviour for all children who had the, the crowns, whole technique crowns placed. And they also reported it, that it was a much easier procedure to perform compared to co their conventional restorative techniques that they usually perform. And also that children experienced low levels of discomfort or no discomfort. And this was also correlated by the parent reports of the child's experience. So um, we had a, a questionnaire that we administered and there were a number of themes that came out of this, um, including that the parents felt that it was a pain-free technique, which they appreciated. It was quick and it was easy. Um, there was no anaesthetic, so, so these are some of the comments that came that we got from the questionnaire. Um, sorry, sit down here. Um, things like no need, no need for that weird numb feeling. I think that's really um, quite important to just take into account that the kids really hate they hate having that numb feeling afterwards. Um, and no drill. And look at this, because when he hears the noise of the machine, he gets anxious, and that's such a common experience for people. And, and children. Um, and, and this interesting, this sense of achievement that the children felt, that they showed everyone proudly and that they're very proud of, of this achievement and getting this shiny, nice shiny crown. Um, some of the things that we've been developing through this research is we've been working very closely with um, the IT applications team um, and developing custom screens to make it easier for clinicians. This is the thing about clinical research that it's, it can be seen as time consuming and it's important for clinicians to know that, they, that we're trying to make it easy for them to be involved and to, um, to, to help us collect information. So on the one hand, this helps clinicians um, enter information easily and it also helps us download and capture information easily. Um, we've also uh, developed a pamphlet, a brochure for the, um, for the technique and for the study. Uh, we've had, thanks to the media department, we've had a lot of um, fantastic media. We've had national newspaper coverage um, and I think that certainly helped with our next process, which was trying to get funding for the next stage. I, I think that helped <laughs> to get the word out there. Um, this also is interesting. It was seen in the Adelaide Advertiser by a research over, researcher over in Adelaide who made a call to us, and we now have him on the next investigators group team. So it's, you know, it's really important to get that media um, coverage. Um, Hanny, beautiful picture of Hanny there in the Byte magazine. That was quite a big um, article. And this is a lovely... Um, uh, case study of one of our um, young girls um, who was unable to, was just able to cooperate having a, a bite wing taken on one side of her mouth with suitable tooth through a whole technique crown, coped with that technique and because she felt so happy and so proud that she'd been able to get this done, was so happy to come back another time and then was able, we were able to get a radiograph on the other side and, and continue and do another whole technique crown. So, you know, it's just, you can see it's a beautiful way of getting children um, to really come on board with treatment. Um, and then also we've had coverage in with by the ADA too, so getting private sector coverage, which is great. Uh, so what next? Um, we're going to continue to review these children over the next um, three years and do radiographic reviews of these teeth um, every 12 months. And we have secured funding, as Jackie said, we have a William Buckland Foundation grant, which is just a fabulous thing to have. Um, and uh, so we're moving into phase two, where we have similar objectives at looking at the acceptance, uh, the success and the acceptability of the, of the whole technique, extending the age group a little bit to seven-year-olds seven year um, to increase our pool of children. But importantly too, we're looking at, um, we want to look at the cost effectiveness of the whole technique compared to multi-surface restorations, as I was talking about earlier. 
And uh, finally, we'll be looking at developing and implementing policies and clinical guidelines and a statewide training program around the whole technique. Um, so just a few things that we're doing, which I think um, are probably ex exemplary of, of how we work within DHSV. Um, not only are we collaborating with a number of partners, which I'll show you at the end, but we're, and we're working with um, interstate people and international collaborations, but we are really using every, every um, department of DHSV in helping us with this research. So it's a whole DHSV thing. It's, like I said, it's using, it's, media are helping us, um, IT applications are helping us. Um, you know, we've, we've got everyone on board, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's partnerships within and without the um, organisation. Um, and yeah, so this, I'll finish up, you'll be glad to know. Um, and um, with thanks to 3M as well, who have, um, who have donated the stainless steel crowns and the cements, but also all these partners who um, you can see here, I don't need to mention them individually, but they're all on board with us. So thank you very much. Uh, this project, uh, and I must uh, acknowledge the, uh, the DHSV Research and Innovation Grant process that uh, also provided the initial study for, or funds for the study in the Hall Technique. Um, and uh, similarly, we'd like to extend this one further, but uh, more of that anon. Um, Picking up Jackie's introductory remarks about providing an evidence base and translating research into practice, uh, how, what's that about? What, how, how do we do that? Um, one of the things we can do is uh, uh, provide clinical guidelines. And um, I, I'm not sure whether you're aware of the clinicians in the room that the uh, Clinical Leadership Council of the HSV does develop and publish best practice guidelines on the, the intranet. Um, these are really designed to help you um, provide the best quality of dental care to the patients and improve the patient uh, health outcomes, oral health outcomes. Um, however, it's not really known if you've got the dent, the, uh, clinical practice guidelines on the website and uh, how does that translate into practice? What are the gap? How do we you know, close that gap? And one of, the, one of the aims of this project is to try and look at how well the, the actual best practice as de derived from the guidelines matches up with practice in the, uh, in the field, so to speak. So, um, so while it's not uh, big, big brother looking at uh, you know using Prism to look at your your uh, dental practice and then um, come in and you know with the uh, drone and, and say you're not doing the right thing, um, the idea is to actually try and measure uh, adherence to the to the guidelines from the practice as the, it's written in the guidelines, uh, sorry, in the uh, records. So to do that, eventually we'd like to develop uh, better point of care support materials so that we can translate the guidelines from the uh, literature to, the, to practice. Um, but you might say, well, I read journals. Um, I'm a good practitioner. Um, the aim of the guidelines is really not uh, to, to um, the Mr. Plod. It's really just to, to provide resources for you uh, in, in everyday practice. And the problem is, even if you read uh, papers two hours a day every day of the year, it would probably take about 80 years to, to just read one year's output from, from the literature. So the guidelines do provide a succinct and uh, distilled version of, of the literature. Um, so the aim, the objectives of this is to, for the first time, look at the, the clinical part of the, the records to examine whether there's sufficient information, first of all, to, to derive whether 
practice is adhering to guidelines. And if there is sufficient information, then to see whether there is adherence or not. Um, and then once we've looked at the gap between the practice and the ideal clinical practice guidelines, then we can say, well, maybe we're not implementing them in, a, in, a, in the optimal way and we can improve that by education, um, computerised decision support systems, uh, presentations or training, uh, experts going out into clinics and, and talking to people in the field. Um, so, since it's a pilot study, we're only really looking at a selection of um, guidelines, and these are namely uh, applying to children, uh, children under 12, and we're looking at stainless steel, not, uh, stainless steel crowns, not necessarily the ones in the hall technique study. Um, provision of restorative care under GA, and uh, d direct restorative materials, linings and bases. So how are we doing that? First of all, we're going to take about 150 dental records, so that's about 50 per guideline, uh, sourced from titanium using the item numbers and so on. Uh, we're going to compare two sites, which is Bowen and RDHM. Um, the uh, clinics are mainly computerised, where we've got paper records here at the hospital. So we'll be able to see whether there's a different information density in the records. Um, and we're going to use do, do case finding by using the specific item numbers. So for stainless steel crowns, we use 576, which will indicate when a crown was placed. But we'll also look at uh, item numbers that involved other deciduous teeth, so 5455, up to 85, and looking at also um, other types of uh, restorations that were put to see whether they were appropriate or should a uh, standard steel crown have been used. So for an example, carrying on from the standard steel crown example, I've taken the, uh, the guideline and extracted indicators. So we've got nine indications for the use of stainless steel crowns. And they're just there, I won't go through them, but uh, those uh, clinicians in the audience may be interested. And then we've got five, which are contraindications for the use. So what we do next is we've got four uh, trained dentists, including Rachel and another uh, couple from um, Barwon, who will then do a clinical audit of the records and um, derive whether, first of all, there is information and then whether it's in accord with the, um, the guidelines. As I've already mentioned, the, the grant round this year, uh, we've got in investigators from uh, Barwon, uh, Dr Michael Smith, well known to some. Um, we've got uh, people from Melbourne Uni who have uh, graciously accepted uh, being investigators. We've got our four reviewers, and I should acknowledge uh, Martin and Raymond and the others in the data team for the work extracting the data from Titanium. I think it's the first time that the actual clinical records have been extracted for any purpose, so it's, uh, again, breaking new ground. Um, so far we've, we've done ethical approvals, we've uh, got some review forms um, based on uh, uh, the infection control, uh, Wendy's uh, eye auditor forms. Uh, we've got an experienced and trained suitable crew and uh, really now we're just ready to start uh, doing the training and then the uh, audit part of the study um, and uh, really try and for the first time gauge the quality of clinical care um, as, as, we, as we can through the records. Eventually you can see how this might flow, it's an entry point 
into the whole cycle of quality of care improvement. So once we know where the gaps lay between what's happening in, in practice, what the guidelines say, we've already found that we can improve the guidelines, how they're developed and presented. Uh, we've engaged with an international expert uh, on our, uh, to, to join our advisory committee. And um, there's a lot of interest, uh, even from the UK last week, in um, where they're doing a similar uh, project. So, um, so I think, you know, there's a huge potential for, for the future. So on that note, thank you so much. Um, I'm here to talk about a very innovative and exciting study which is being led by DHSV. The full title, it's very long-winded, Assessing Cost-Effectiveness of Implementing a Minimal Intervention Dentistry Approach in Community Dental Clinics Clinical Trial. So the user-friendly term, as you now know, is ACE-MID study. Today we've heard terms and, and elements around um, health literacy, patient empowerment, patient-centred care, new models of care. This study aims to encompass all those elements. And as I said, it's a very exciting um, and innovative study that we're lead, leading. MID, sorry, sorry, what is minimal intervention dentistry? Well, it focuses on maximising conservation of demineralised but non-cavitated enamel and dentine. It's a change and a shift from the traditional surgical approach to the management of early curious lesions, creates opportunities for early identification of the disease and promoting a healing process and its management, and it transcends across all age groups, so it's suitable for preschoolers, and also for older adults. The five elements of MID are identification of risk factors at the individual level, remineralisation of the early non-cavitated active lesions, about in, uh, individualised preventative strategies, implementing them and a lot of goal setting and care planning, where appropriate placement of restorations in teeth, minimising as much of the natural tooth as possible and using, and using a minimal cavity design, and where appropriate repairing rather than replacing of defective restorations. So what are the benefits of MID in public dentistry? Well, MID has the potential to improve the management of dental caries disease, and as we know and as we've heard, the um, oral health status of our patients is decreasing. So this is about trying to improve the overall dental caries disease, enabling early identification and healing, reducing the need for that complex restoration in adults, so stopping that cycle, increasing retention of the natural dentition, creating opportunities for patient self-management of dental caries condition and addressing the worsening public oral health. Um, Particularly with regards to patient self-management, it really is about empowering the patient, working with the patient as a partner, and in this case, our patients or our participants will be adolescents, but also with their carers, and um, to try and implement and embed changes in their oral health behaviour and practices. So the adolescents in Australia, we know that uh, Australian teenagers are at increased risk of developing dental disease. Between 40 and 57% of 12 to 15 year old teenagers have had one or more permanent teeth affected by decay. And unfortunately, the number of teeth affected increases with age. So what are we doing? Well, what we're doing to try and help address this problem and put forward a new model of care is undertaking a <coughs> clinical trial to assess how cost effective it is to actually implement MID approach to a group of adolescents who are in the public patient, public patients who are at increased risk of dental caries compared to what we're currently doing. DHSV is leading this study, but we're working with the Melbourne University Melbourne Dental School and with Deakin Health Economics from Deakin University, who will be undertaking the cost effectiveness. We're also working with 12 community dental clinics located across metropolitan Melbourne. Here we have the 10 lead agencies who we're working with, and we have their commitment, their goodwill, and their enthusiasm, and I appreciate and, and thank you all of the agencies for their involvement in this study. Two of the agencies, both Peninsula Health and ISIS, have two sites which are part of this study. And of course the other partners, as I said, are our patients and their carers. So our objectives. We want to demonstrate that there's a reduction in the number of new and progressive progressing curious lesions among the participants who have actually undertaken the MID approach compared to those in the control group. We want to demonstrate if MID is in fact value for money. 
I want to assess how accepting the um, clinicians, agency staff and management are to an MID model of care and approach. And I'll importantly identify the barriers and enablers to adopting the MID approach, not just amongst those already mentioned, but also again amongst the adolescents and their carers. We have started recruiting 504 adolescents to the study. There's still a way to go, but I'm very excited at how well the study has already progressed. So these adolescents will be aged or aged between 11 to 14 years of age, and they are at high risk to dental caries. So that's 42 participants from each of the 12 community dental clinics. These adolescents are being recruited um, when they are attending their 12, 18 or 24 month recall, and if they have active disease present, they may be eligible to join the study. Of course, assuming they also meet the other eligibility criteria. Or they could be new patients to the service, who are again aged 11 to 14, who also have active disease present. So that's quite a, a very broad pool of adolescents that we're recruiting from. What's different about this study? Well, we're using a different innovative workforce model where we have dental assistants with a certificate for renewal health promotion who will be implementing the MID preventative strategies to the intervention participants. And these dental assistants have been trained in the nationally accredited unit of competency application of fluoride varnish. So we've extended the scope of practice to be able to do that. It's the first study of its kind in Australia in public dental sector, and it's a community-based study. The difference between the two groups, all of the participants will be examined by the oral health examiner who has been recruited to this study. The oral health examiner um, has a qualification in either oral health promote, excuse me, uh, is either an oral health therapist, a dental therapist, or a dental hygienist. And um, the therapist, will, the examiner will examine each of the children at the baseline, then again at 12 months and again at 24 months. Now those in the control group will receive standard care, including any referrals to the community dental therapist if required for restorations or on any other surgical intervention. Those in the intervention group, in addition to the examinations at baseline 12 and 24 months, will also receive the MID approach. They'll receive that at baseline after they've had their examination, at three and six month recall, again at 12 months after their examination, and at 18 month recall, and lastly at the, uh, following their 24 month examination. The intervention participants, they'll have a saliva testing done at baseline, again at 24 months, to identify those who with an increased risk to dental caries as a result of the low salivary flow. And if they're if indicated, they'll be issued with tooth mousse. They'll receive diet counselling, oral hygiene instructions, an individual I'd agreed, agreed home care plan. So the DA will work with the patient about setting some achievable goals. They'll be issued with disclosing tablets that the children can take at home and we're advising them to use a disclosing tablet once a week so they themselves can assess how well they're doing really with brushing and flossing and so forth. And they'll have Girofat applied to all tooth surfaces. For well, participating in the study, we are giving the intervention participants a novel care pack at each of those visits, and that will consist of a, si a soft bristle toothbrush, Nutriflow toothpaste, which is 5,000 ppm toothpaste, waxed floss, again, the disclosing tablets, oral health promotion resources, and tooth mousse, again, if it's indicated. I just want to say, and I'm sorry that I actually don't have a photo shot of this on the screen, but this suite of resources was developed in consultation with our communications Media and Communications Department, our Health Promotion Department. Uh, we engaged adolescents, some of whom were family members and friends of families, which was great. Uh, the Consumer Advisory Group was also canvassed for their feedback. And of course, we work with the graphic designer. And, and I'm very proud of the suite of resources that we've developed as part of this study. So the intervention um, participants will receive a health promotion resource and also any other products, such as a water bottle and a sugar-free gum, for example, and some other products. All of, the, um, all of the participants will receive a birthday card in the first and second year of the study. It's, I'm not sure how effective that's going to be, but anyway, it's just about trying to keep it on the agenda and keep it fresh and what have you. So they're going to get a birthday card. Um, those in the control group will receive a $10 gift card when they attend their 12 and 24 month recall examinations. And those in the control group will receive all the products that have been issued to the intervention participants on completion of the study. We're collecting a lot of data in this study. So the clinical data we're collecting is the bleeding index, the ICDAS-2, 
and the Plaque Index. We're collecting uh, participant and parent socioeconomic data, uh, oral health knowledge and the, of the participants and their carers, carers that will be collected at the baseline 12 and 24 months. The clinician's baseline knowledge and attitudes of MID will be collected and we've started to do that. Uh, we're collecting information around agencies' current recall systems and how it works and how it might differ from agency to agency. Identifying challenges to the adop adoption of MID from all the stakeholders. We'll be running focus groups with participants and carers in the intervention arm of the study, on completion of the study. And of course, as I said, Deakin University will be undertaking uh, an economic appraisal of the MID. So far, clinicians at the, the 12 community dental clinics are responsible for screening their adolescent patients for their suitability to join the study. We've recently launched an online CPD learning module to assist clinicians to screen adolescents. And the screening tool is uploaded on Titanium, so it's easy to use that screening tool, which obviously uh, just walks the clinician through the eligibility criteria for the study. We've recruited 35 participants so far to the study, and we've actually examined 20 participants at six of the 12 community dental clinics. We've collected questionnaire data from the clinicians at the respective clinics about their attitudes to MID. And as I said, we've also collected information around their recall processes and procedures. The impact this, this is for you, or might be for you in public dentistry, is that we're building evidence which will inf influence a practice change to the management of oral health disease, and namely caries management. It's about leading a change in funding model and policy development and putting forward an alternative workforce model. And lastly, with a focus on prevention, long term this approach aims to break the cycle of complex restorative care and reduce the demand on the public dental system. Thank you for your time.